Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, team, for leading us so well. Well, good morning. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. Kids, you can hop up and head out with your teachers. One thing I wanted to mention also, in your bulletin, you should have received an insert uh, on how to pray for those shoe boxes. So you can follow that this week as you pray for those kids that will be receiving those. <clears throat> well, last week, Reed mentioned uh, very briefly that he and I went on a beautiful hike, and actually Greg Meller was with us uh, a few weeks ago, and it got me thinking of today's passage and how there's a phrase that we all use, and it's often used after we do something difficult uh, or we go through something tough. Whether it's a task we've completed or a situation that maybe we go through, uh, maybe it's after a long hike for us, after a long run that I go on, maybe for you it could be a tough job, um, a difficult surgery, or if you've slaved away in the kitchen for hours and you finally get to enjoy that meal. We usually say this when we exchange effort or energy for something that we think is valuable. And that little phrase is, it was worth it. Have you said that before? It was worth the difficulty or the stress or the cost. You look back and you see what you went through and you say, it was worth it. Or, of course, the opposite is also true. You look back at what you went through and you say, it wasn't worth it at all. <laughs> uh, but today, our story tells us it was worth it. Last week we had the birth of Jesus, and this week we'll see the wise men come to visit him, and in their story they tell us that it was worth it for them. It was worth it because he is worthy. So our text is Matthew 2 today. You can go ahead and turn there, <clears throat> the first 12 verses. I think you'll know this story well. If you need a copy of God's Word today, we have one for you. It should be in the seat in front of you. It's a black Bible there. And if you don't own a copy, you can feel free to take that home. That's our gift to you. So let's go ahead and read those first 12 verses there in chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people, and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, report back to me, so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When, the ch when they saw the star... They were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with his mother, with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Let's ask God for his help this morning. God, would you help us as we look into your word today? Would you give us ears to hear and open our eyes, please? I pray that the Spirit of God would reveal truth to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our story this morning takes place after Jesus' birth in Bethlehem last Sunday. We saw that he was born to Joseph and Mary, but our time gap between his birth and the wise men visiting him is at a minimum a few months, maybe even up to two years later. So it's possible that all of those nativity scenes that we own 
uh, should actually have Jesus standing next to Mary and the wise men. But you don't have to throw them away, please. So who were these wise men? They were educated. They were advisors and noblemen. A couple places in Scripture actually mention wise men or magi. A character that you're probably familiar with is from the Old Testament, Belteshazzar, or Daniel, as we know him to be. <clears throat> Daniel 4.9 says that he was a wise man, given that he interpreted dreams for King Nebuchadnezzar. So these wise men, they were oftentimes advisors to kings. And Matthew tells us that these men were from the Far East, which was somewhere over in Persia. We don't know exactly where in Persia, but their journey would have been about 800 miles. You can imagine how difficult a journey that would be, getting on a horseback or camelback or even by foot, whatever they chose. To go 800 miles, you'd have to be convinced that it would be worth it. And you'd have to have determination. Their determination was to pursue the Messiah. So for example, to put this in our perspective, the length of California is 760 miles long. So if you jumped on a horse up in Crescent City at the top of the state, and then you rode down to just before Tijuana, right before the border there, that would be uh, about this trip. It'd be incredibly strenuous and demanding, right? These guys, they're not just jumping into the SUV for a road trip, okay? It's not that easy for them. They were outside, exposed to the elements, which meant they dealt with bad weather. The terrain wasn't easy. There was the danger of thieves on the road. And then any other complication that happens in that kind of a long trip. I know 800 miles in a car isn't easy, but none of us can imagine traveling for this long and this way. So remember that nativity scene? Well, it could be wrong again, and I'm really sorry. There probably weren't just three wise men. What? I know. Traveling this far would have certainly required supplies and preparation. This would have taken some extensive planning. Traveling in this fashion and over this distance, 800 miles, it would have been a monumental task, and it would have involved a whole group of people. They gave up months of, their, months of their lives to do this, but they were determined to pursue Jesus because they believed that he was worthy of it. Do you believe that Jesus is worthy of your pursuit? And then are you determined to pursue him? Maybe another way to phrase this is what keeps you from pursuing God? It starts when you put your faith in him to save you, and then you move to pursuing him in other things, like going to church on Sunday, being part of a Bible study, or a discipleship group, so that your faith and your pursuit of Christ grows. This pursuit isn't easy, and so we must ask God to give us the strength to overcome obstacles in pursuing him. Maybe the biggest obstacle is one of inconvenience. Our society, more than ever, chooses the path of least resistance. Inconvenience comes in so many different forms. For these men, 800 miles was a huge inconvenience. And each day there's a battle or like a competition that goes on between what we should do and what we want to do, right? More often than not, it's inconvenient to do what we should do. And so sometimes we default to what's easier. Maybe it's inconvenient for you to wake up early so that you can study God's word. You're tired and you just want to sleep in. Or it's inconvenient to attend that Bible study. Or the community group. Or maybe even church on Sunday. It's, been, it's, just, it's just been a long day and you feel like you don't want to do anything else. You don't want to talk to anyone else. We've all been there, right? I'm not trying to make enemies up here, I promise. I, I just want to challenge us to pursue God and to be determined to pursue him. I've always loved the Bible character Daniel. And I love that it says in chapter 1, verse 8, that Daniel purposed in his heart. Or the CSB says, he determined. 
He made a choice. He wasn't going to defile his body. We must determine, we must make a choice that we are going to pursue God. So what's the inconvenience that keeps you from pursuing God? I'd encourage you to pray and ask him to strengthen you and to help you grow in this area. This passage, it also gives us a beautiful picture of how the gospel is for all people. These weren't Jewish men coming to see their Messiah. They were Gentiles. They were outsiders coming to worship him. And they're some of the first examples of those who would worship Jesus. This shows us that outsiders are welcomed into the family of God. Jesus will accept those who worship him. He puts zero stipulations on your family history, your pedigree, the home that you grew up in, even your knowledge of him. The gospel is for every nation, tribe, people, and language. All are welcome. We move on to our next character here in this story, King Herod, or Herod the Great, as I'm sure he preferred. Who was King Herod? <clears throat> well, Herod got his nickname the Great for good reason, actually. He was an incredible architect and builder. He developed and built towers and theaters. He renovated the temple in Jerusalem. He also constructed a massive port by the sea in Caesarea. And the way he fortified his walls and built his defense systems were like no other king had ever done. And so many kings actually took their cues from what he did. But in addition to being a great mind and a pioneer, <clears throat> Herod was incredibly paranoid, mainly of people taking his throne and his kingdom, which led him to being a terrible, vicious ruler. He would go to great lengths to protect his power even killing family members who threatened him. He was obsessed with the power that he had, and he couldn't stand the thought of losing it. He ruled from the city of Jerusalem over Judea, which included many, many Jews. So in verse 2, when the wise men come and ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? This isn't good news for Herod, because in his mind, he was the king of the Jews. He ruled over them. So I want us to see the distress, the distress of Herod. It says in verse 3, When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Why was he distressed? Well, because of what we just said, right? He was paranoid and obsessed with his power. He couldn't have anyone stripping that away from him. He was the king of the Jews. And when he heard these wise men saying that there was another king born, he, become, he became very upset. This wasn't like a distress like you and I experience. We get upset if something doesn't go our way or if plans fall through. That's how we get upset. Herod's distress was next level. It caused the entire city of Jerusalem to also be distressed. You know that saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? If Herod ain't happy, then people may lose their heads, okay? That's the kind of distress we're dealing with here, and he would go to great lengths to protect all of his power. The entire city knew that when something bad happened in the palace, you better brace yourself for the impact of Herod's reaction. So here, he wanted nothing to do with the Messiah because, you see, he only saw Jesus as a threat to his kingdom. He saw the potential of losing his control. And it's easy for us to look at Herod and think that he's a complete maniac, right? We would never rule like that. We would never be a tyrant. But let's look at ourselves. Where is our own kingdom threatened by Jesus? And I'm not talking about an actual kingdom, right? I'm talking about your life, your beliefs, your plans, or as the engagement project puts it, your script. Is Jesus a threat to what you want in life? Do those desires go against what he teaches? 
For example, what he says on the subject of sexual purity and finances and relationships and parenting. Do you obey him on these things? Is he a threat to your speech and how you treat people? My point is that we actually are similar to Herod. We feel threatened by Jesus when he goes against what we want. We would never say those words, but sometimes the teachings in the Bible contradict the way we live. Things like how you plan your weekends. Is church a priority for you? What you base your family values on? How you disciple your kids? What career you pursue? On and on. In some of these areas, we don't want to know or hear what Jesus says. And it really boils down to this. We want Jesus as our Savior, but not as our King. In other words, of course I want him to save me from hell, but then it'd be great if he could just step out of the picture and let me live how I want to live. Friend, Jesus will not share his throne with anyone. And so if we want Jesus as our Savior, then we must also have him as our King. We must, des- we must die to our selfish desires. We must begin saying yes to his leading and then surrender our will to him. This is what it means for Jesus to be our king. We must believe and trust that he is a worthy king. And Herod was having none of that. He completely rejected this. So let's look at verse 4 now. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. So Herod feels the distress of a new king that's born. He gathers the priests and the scribes together. These are the guys that know the Old Testament. They know the prophecies. Truthfully, they should have been the ones looking for the Messiah. They should have been in Bethlehem worshiping him. They knew because 700 years before this, Micah prophesied about Jesus coming. And they tell Herod that he's in Bethlehem. And then verse 6 lays out the prophecy. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. He uses the word ruler, which means one ruler over all. There would be one to come who would be born in Bethlehem and he would reign over all people. So now this gets us to our next point, which is the deceit of Herod. You can kind of see his mind working as he calls together these men, and they announce this location. He's devising a plan to take care of this threat. He needs to eliminate it. Once Herod knows the location, he calls the wise men in and asks them when the star appeared. And so he's trying to gauge the age of Jesus, right? He's putting together this timeline. He sends them on to Bethlehem and then tells them, go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. And of course, we read that and we say, yeah, right. We see right through you, Herod. But these wise men, most likely they didn't know his true intentions. Remember, they're not from Judea. So they weren't familiar with him. News didn't travel like it does today. So they probably didn't know much about his reputation. But his intentions were clearly to use the wise men so that he could find out where this so-called king of the Jews was. And he was deceitful when he said that he wanted to worship him. We know he didn't really want to do that. But what about us? What about you? Do you proclaim with your mouth that you intend to follow Jesus and that you intend to worship him, but your life doesn't back it up at all? Are you guilty of putting on this false front of a follower of Jesus and then your actions would tell people a different story? If we're all honest, I think we struggle with this from from time to time. All of us. Christians are often blamed for hypocrisy. Unfortunately, you hear that often, that Christians say one thing, but then they do another. 
So we have to be careful to align our speech and our actions. They must be in concert together for us to be effective Christians. I think we have to also be careful not to deceive ourselves in thinking that we are honoring and glorifying God just because we speak like a Christian or just because we follow a set of rules. Traditions and commands don't sanctify sinners. Surely they don't. It's through the blood of Jesus alone that we are cleansed and sanctified. And so, because of that, the condition of your heart is what matters to God. Later here in Matthew, Jesus addresses hypocrisy. He quotes a prophecy from Isaiah in chapter 15, verse 8. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines human commands. So it's possible for us to give praise and worship to God with our lips, and then we can leave this place and our hearts are so far from God. Jesus calls it whitewashed tombs. On the outside, it looks like you love God, but on the inside, you don't want him reigning in your heart. You don't listen to him, and you don't obey him. Herod stated that he wanted to worship the king, but his heart was full of deceit. What is the condition of your heart this morning? Are you deceitful by making people believe as if you want Jesus, but you know in your heart that day after day you're rejecting him? Look at verse 9 now. It says that the wise men are sent down to Bethlehem, which is just about six miles from Jerusalem. Okay? So not that far. Plus, after 800 miles, six miles is nothing. So they head down to Bethlehem, and they're, there they see the star over the house where Jesus was. The final destination. They breathe a sigh of relief. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Why do you think that is? Could be that they knew their long journey was over. They'd finally arrived. Months and months of traveling. All of the anticipation was building up to this. All for the purpose to come and worship the king. Now, I've never traveled for months on end to get to a destination, so I can't even fathom the relief that these guys had. But it reminds me of the Oregon Trail. Has anyone ever played the Oregon Trail game? Yeah, it's that game where you cross America uh, in a covered wagon and hope that you don't die from disease or whatever else. But I think here, this is more like the Persian Trail, right? They made it. They survived this long road, and they were overwhelmed with joy. Jesus was there in the house. It says that when they entered the house, they saw Jesus, and they fell to their knees in worship. They fell to their knees, acknowledging the Son of God and affirming the deity of Jesus Christ. Last week, Pastor Reed touched on this a little bit. Jesus was the Son of God, which meant he was divine in nature. He was God in human form, and it put them on their knees. Whether it's when we pray or when we worship, <clears throat> kneeling communicates a sign of submission, <clears throat> excuse me, honor and respect. It's been practiced throughout history, usually when kings are present or royalty. <clears throat> and so it's very fitting that these men fall to their knees in worship of King Jesus. He was worthy of their worship. This small child, this God-man, was sinless and pure. He was sent by his Father to atone for the sins of all mankind. No other man could qualify for this. Jesus alone, because of his deity, could pay our ransom. And this is why we must place our faith and trust in him in order for us to be recognized by God the Father as heirs of eternal life. You see, we are not qualified to be the atonement. We can't save ourselves, and it's through Jesus alone. It's only his blood that can purchase our freedom. Like these wise men, 
Do you recognize the deity of Christ? And not just recognize it, do you affirm the deity of Christ? And does it lead you to fall on your knees and surrender to him? It brings us back to that question, is Jesus your Savior and your King? Was deity demands submission and surrender. This means our lives fall in line with what the Scripture teaches and what it says for every topic in our life. It should inform and direct the way that we live. We don't get to pick and choose what we like and then just ignore the bad stuff or the stuff that we don't like. Jesus must be king over all of our life, and that's not popular right now. But following Jesus never made anyone popular. Are there things in your life that you are holding on to right now, things that you don't want to surrender to God? Not only does his deity demand surrender, but we also learn here that it demands worship. We see all of this in just the first few moments when the wise men saw Jesus. They fell to their knees in submission and surrender, and then they worshiped him. Are your affections stirred for Jesus today? When we gather together on Sunday mornings, we gather as a corporate fellowship to worship Christ together through song, through prayer, in our giving and preaching, and in the way that you volunteer and serve in this church. These are the ways to worship the Savior King. I hope that each of you feel a sense of freedom to worship here at Calvary, a freedom to sing out and lift your hands, even clap. And if you're not active in the worship, then you are missing out on opportunities to give God glory. We are vessels to be used for His glory, not just on Sundays, but every day, right? The next part of this story is what some would consider the best part of Christmas, although they'd be mistaken, the gift-giving. The wise men proceeded to give him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, three gifts which probably lead to the tradition of three wise men. So these were very expensive gifts. Gold, of course, was a precious metal, which was the standard currency in that day. I probably don't need to go on a discourse here of why gold is valuable. I think we'd all like to get gold as a gift. But we know that they adorned temples with it and palaces. And so gold could have represented royalty. Second was frankincense. It was an ingredient that the Israelites were commanded to use in their rituals and offerings. Maybe you've used frankincense oil. It's one of the more expensive oils to purchase especially if it's pure frankincense. And so the purity of this could have represented the divinity of Christ. And then lastly, they gave him myrrh. Myrrh was also similar to frankincense. They're both from a gum resin from the tree. Myrrh was also very valuable and often used to anoint the dead. In the Gospel of John, Nicodemus donated 75 pounds of this to anoint the body of Jesus after he died. So this is common to use on corpses, and it wasn't cheap at all. So myrrh could have represented the humanity of Christ. We aren't certain why these men chose these specific gifts, but we do know that they gave him the best that they had. No doubt Joseph and Mary were very thankful for these, and they probably used them to finance a part of their life, pay for some of the expenses that they had. The wise men gave expensive gifts, and they gave it with joyful hearts because he was worthy of their treasures. It's tough to give away treasures, isn't it? You think of the things that we own, the costliest things that we own, houses, property, possessions, vehicles, whatever it is, maybe time and energy. That's one of the hardest ones sometimes. Are you willing to give it to God? Matthew, in writing this account, He would have known the prophecy from Isaiah 60, which was written 600 years before this. Listen to what this prophecy says. It's pretty awesome. Nations will come to your light and kings to your shining brightness. Raise your eyes and look around. They all gather and come to you. Your sons will come from far away and your daughters on the hips of nursing mothers. 
Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will tremble and rejoice, because the, because the riches of the sea will become yours, and the wealth of the nations will come to you. Caravans of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Apha, all of them will come from Sheba. They will carry gold and frankincense and proclaim the praises of the Lord. Hundreds of years before his birth, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah telling him of this. He says they will carry gold and frankincense and proclaim the praises of the Lord, affirming his deity, the Lord of lords. He is God in flesh. This is why 30-some years later, Jesus is crucified on a cross for our sins. He was able to satisfy the wrath of God. If Jesus was not divine, then his life would not have been enough. And in contrast, you and I are nowhere near divine. Near divine. And so our life and our works are not sufficient. Just as I said earlier, it is through Christ alone that we are saved. The deity of Jesus Christ qualifies him to be worthy of our praise and worship. Where are you placing that worship this morning? Is it focused on God, or is it focused on yourself? The devil wants you consumed with yourself. He wants that so that God is robbed of his glory. Don't believe his lie. He just wants to ruin your life. His lie is that it's okay to pursue those selfish desires and your flesh. Friends, the devil is subtle. You won't see him coming. Peter warns of this. In 1 Peter 5, 8, he says this, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. You know, most likely I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and go rob a bank or murder someone. That would be extreme, right? But I may make up, or I may wake up, and I may, I may make choices that gratify my flesh, the choices that will lead me slowly down a road of destruction, where I'm focused on pleasing myself rather than God. And by doing this, I will rob God of the glory that he deserves We'd better not believe the lie that life would be better if I did what I wanted to do and chase after my desires. This is where the devil will devour us. There's also a lie that we must reject, and it's that if we follow Jesus, then we will miss out on the good things in life. Those so-called good things are temporal and they fade fast. Oh, for sure, they'll bring you some happiness for a short time until you want it again and again, and there's no lasting joy in them. An easy example to look at is stuff. How often do you and I buy something because we think it will satisfy, and within weeks or even days, we are looking for something else new and shiny? This happens all the time. There's no lasting fulfillment in living for yourself. We must put our eyes on Christ and live for him because he is worthy of it. He wants to give us real life. He wants to fill the void in us and not just fill it. He can satisfy it. He satisfies your mind, your heart, and your conscience. And he does that when you surrender your life to him and pursue his will. These wise men experienced this as they were determined to pursue the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And then as they submitted and worshipped him, their response to Christ was very different than Herod's. The wise men, they embraced Jesus, embraced him as their king and authority, while Herod denied and rejected him. And this morning, how will you respond to Jesus? Do you see him like the wise men did, overwhelmed with excitement and joy, kneeling before him as king, giving him the worship that he deserves? Do you see him as the scribes did? Remember, they missed him. They were passive in their response. They shrugged him off. 
Or do you see him as Herod did, with rejection and contempt, seeing him as a threat to your way of life, a threat to the sin that you love? Friend, Jesus came to save you from that sin. And there's a choice that you have, either either to respond in repentance and surrender, surrendering to him as king of your life, or you can choose to reject him. And there's no neutral ground here, okay? You're for Jesus, or you are against Jesus. Even those scribes who missed him, in missing him, they rejected him. This morning, if you're here and you have rejected him, and you've not surrendered and believed in him, then I pray that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes today. It's only the Spirit of God that can change your heart. But when he does... He changes your affections and your inclinations and your disposition. It's what he does. He takes dead things and makes them alive. He will breathe new life into you so that you are into the family of God. And if you think that your life is a mess and that God the Father won't accept you because of the things you've done or maybe the things that you're doing, We're all in that same boat. None of us is good enough. (laughs) But you're right. He doesn't accept sin. But he accepted the perfect life of his son, Jesus. And it's through him alone that we can have our sins forgiven. So friend, repent and call on his name. He will save you. You could never do enough good works that would make God look at you as clean and accept you. It's only through the blood that Jesus shed for you on your behalf that you can be cleaned. So let Jesus clean you. Here's what the scriptures say in 1 John 1. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First, it is through Jesus alone that we are saved. No one else, no other name. Second, we are all in need of saving because it says that we have all sinned. And if we think that we haven't, then we're just lying and deceiving ourselves. And then lastly, God promises that if we confess, then he will forgive. So again, if you're here and you have not trusted in Jesus, myself or Pastor Reed, we would love to speak with you after this service today. Our story concludes, and this last part is a little bit ironic to me. In verse 12, the wise men are warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. That's kind of funny how that happened. They could interpret dreams. So I doubt they had any trouble in figuring this out. I can just see them, they're waking up, breakfast one morning. Did you have that dream? Yeah, yeah, you? Yeah. And they all are in agreement not to go back to Herod. Church family, pursuing Jesus with our lives isn't going to be easy. Jesus says that it won't. But I hope that today your faith has grown and that the Holy Spirit has worked in your heart to confirm that it is worth it because he is worthy. Let's pray.